On the 28th of August 1978, a Bulgarian man named Vladimir Kostov was getting off of the Paris metro at the Arc de Triomphe stop when he heard a muffled crack like an air gun and felt a sharp sting in his lower back. He turned around but all he saw was a man carrying a small bag who simply walked away without a word. Kostov was confused but went about his day. Later, Kostov examined his back and noticed a small red mark. Shortly afterwards, he began to develop a fever that got progressively worse and was soon admitted to hospital. He spent 12 days there with the worst sickness of his life, but eventually he recovered. 10 days after the strange encounter on the metro, on the 7th of September 1978, another Bulgarian man named Georgi Markov was on his way to work in central London. He was waiting at a bus stop on Waterloo Bridge and, while craning his neck to see if his bus was coming, he felt a sharp pain in the back of his right leg like the sting of an insect. As he turned around, he saw a man picking up an umbrella from the ground. The man mumbled an apology in a foreign accent, then quickly crossed the road, got into a black cab and disappeared into the London traffic. A few minutes later, Markov was on the bus, wondering what had happened. When he got to work, he checked the back of his leg and found a small pimple on the surface of his skin. When Markov returned to his South London home that evening, he told his wife about the incident on the bridge and informed her that he wasn't feeling well. He'd begun to develop a fever and generally felt weak and ill. Throughout the next day, on the 8th of September, his fever only got worse. That night, he was finding it difficult to speak, so his wife took him to the hospital. The following description comes from Dr. Rufus Crompton. At 11.13 p.m., he was admitted to St. James's Hospital in Balham. Examination of the right thigh showed an approximately 6 cm diameter circular region of induration or hardening together with inflammation, in the center of which was a 2 mm diameter puncture mark. It was concluded that this was probably a pyrexia, which means fever, of unknown origin, what the doctors call PUO, with septicemia, meaning blood poisoning. The next day, at 6.30pm on Saturday the 9th of September, there was a dramatic collapse of the patient's blood pressure. His pulse rose to 160 beats per minute and his temperature fell. At this stage, Markov was transferred to the intensive therapy unit. Vomiting became a pronounced feature with blood in the vomit. The electrocardiogram on Sunday the 11th of September showed complete block of the conduction system of the heart. It was thought that an electrical pacemaker might have to be used. However, before that happened, confusion increased and the patient started pulling out his intravenous lines. Cardiac arrest occurred at 9.45 a.m. And, after vigorous attempts at resuscitation, death was confirmed at 10.40 a.m. on the 11th of September. His last white cell count had risen to the dizzy height of 33,200 cells per cubic millimeter. The mysterious story was soon picked up by the British media. Georgi Markov's name regularly appeared in newspapers in the weeks and months following his death, and the incident eventually became one of the most infamous events of the Cold War. But who was Georgi Markov, and what on earth had happened to him? Markov was born in Bulgaria in 1929, in the outskirts of its capital city of Sofia. In the late 1950s, he began writing books and plays, and by the early 60s, he had gained national recognition and popularity throughout Bulgaria, and eventually he even entered the inner circle of Todor Zhivkov, Bulgaria's communist leader. However, Markov himself grew more and more fundamentally against the authoritarian regime that ruled his country. He began writing and putting on more and more controversial plays that criticized the communist state, Despite this, Zhivkov gave Markov a lot more leniency than other writers would have received at the time, but his patience was being tested. In 1969, the communist authorities had started to crack down on any form of dissidence due to the attempted Czech uprising the previous year. It was at this time that Markov put on his most controversial and critical play of all, and it turned out to be the last straw for Zhivkov. After a single private showing of the play, in Sofia, in front of the party and government elite, the audience became outraged at the play's sarcastic tone. 
Markov was summoned to face the Committee of Culture, but refused to attend, and instead went to meet a friend who told him, you have to leave immediately. Markov knew that he'd crossed the line, so he travelled to Italy to stay with his brother for a while, and to allow time for the heat to die down. Eventually, he decided to stay in the West, and relocated to London. Around this time, he started working for the Bulgarian section of the BBC World Service. Later, he also worked with Deutsche Welle and with Radio Free Europe, alongside Vladimir Kostov, the man who would go on to have the strange encounter on the Parisian metro. At these different organisations, Markov began broadcasting his experiences of living under the regime, as well as his fierce anti-authoritarian views. Back in Bulgaria, his books were banned, and he was sentenced in absentia to six and a half years in prison for his defection. However, Markov had no intention of returning to Bulgaria to see out his sentence, or of stopping his broadcasts while the Communist Party still existed. In 1977, Markov's father became ill, and Markov sought permission from the Bulgarian government to freely travel to be with him, but he was refused. Markov's wife later said of this time, Georgi was so incensed by his father's death that his broadcasts became absolutely vitriolic. He named the mistresses of the high ups, really smearing mud on the people in the inner circles. In the same way that Markov was problematic for the communist regime, Vladimir Kozdov had also become a problem for his own defection and for similar broadcasts denigrating the leaders of his home country. And so, on the 28th of August 1978, Vladimir Kozdov was attacked with a high-tech, covert weapon while exiting the Paris metro. Ten days later, on the 7th of September 1978, which just so happened to be Todor Zhivkov's 67th birthday, Georgi Markov was also attacked while waiting for a bus on a busy London street. So, what happened after the assassination? Well, the day after Markov's death, on the 12th of September, Dr. Crompton, whose description of Markov's deterioration we heard earlier in the video, performed an autopsy on the body. He took tissue from the site of the puncture wound on Markov's leg, which eventually found its way to Dr. David Gall, who was a research medical officer at the chemical defense establishment. This is what Dr. Gall said about his experiences. On the 12th of September, we were sent two very generous pieces of tissue and clinical details about his illness and death, and about the strange events on Waterloo Bridge. We were deciding where to take a piece for our work, and I saw that Rufus had put in a pin to keep his orientation on a piece of loose tissue and had pushed it to the hilt, obviously to give him some kind of mark. To my alarm, this pin had moved an inch across the tissue. It was a loose piece of metal. It was really very lucky that it did not roll off the post-mortem table and onto the floor. We sent it to the Metropolitan Police Forensic Science Laboratory for further investigation. We reckon that it was about a millimetre and a half in diameter, and that those holes could probably have contained about half a milligram of material inside. It certainly looked as though it had something to do with Markov's illness and demise, and could have been the vehicle in which some poison had been packed. Let me dispose of the question of toxin in the tissues. We were not able to find any. We felt that we had tried quite hard, but the fact was that by no means could we demonstrate the presence of anything toxic, let alone identify it. So, how did they deduce what had killed Markov? Well, the tiny size of the pellet greatly narrowed down the possible candidates for the poison, since many poisons would need to be administered in much larger doses. Also, the progression of Markov's symptoms ruled out a load of other possible candidates. In the end, they decided that there weren't very many poisons, chemical or biological, that could have been used. Their main suspect was a highly potent biological toxin known as ricin. Ricin is a protein that occurs naturally in castor beans. Castor beans. So what are we going to do with them? Are we just going to grow a magic beanstalk? Huh? Climate? Escape? We are going to process them into ricin. Ricin means. When making videos like this, I have to do a huge amount of research, so I'm always on the lookout for free and easy ways to learn new things. That's why I'm very happy to be partnering with Brilliant for this video. Brilliant.org is the best website to learn maths, data science, and computer science. 
When I'm not YouTubing, I actually teach science and maths full time. So as a teacher, I know that what makes things stick in your head better than anything is putting your knowledge into practice. And Brilliant makes this easy with thousands of fun, interactive lessons from beginner level to advanced, and they're continuing to add new content every month. Personally, I've been using it to learn Python, which is something I always wanted to dive into but never knew how to start. When I signed up, they gave me a quick quiz and it matched me perfectly with lessons that fit my skill level. Since using Brilliant, I've learned how to code simple programs and I was amazed at how easy it was for me to learn. To get started with Brilliant, use the link brilliant.org slash chemistorian to get a free 30-day trial and the first 200 people that use my link will also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Please check it out, it's a great deal and not only will you be able to level up your skills and knowledge, you'll also be helping out my channel as well. The happier the sponsors are, the more videos like this I'll be able to make. Speaking of which, let's get back to the video. So, castor beans. These are the same beans used to make castor oil, which has been used for years as a laxative, a moisturizer, and even to induce labor. Fortunately, there's no need to worry about ricin poisoning when handling castor oil, since the heating during the oil extraction process denatures and deactivates the protein, rendering it harmless. Even if the ricin wasn't denatured, it's not oil soluble, so only trace amounts would be found in the extracted castor oil anyway. However, if ricin is successfully extracted from the castor beans, a very small dose would be fatal. When ingested into the body, ricin acts as a toxin by inhibiting protein synthesis, which is the process by which cells assemble amino acids into various proteins, including enzymes, which are the body's natural catalysts that allow countless chemical reactions to occur fast enough to support life. Without these vital proteins, the chemical reactions that keep the body alive would occur far too slowly, and the body would start to shut down. Dr. Gall said, We felt that ricin was a sufficiently strong candidate to warrant trying to mimic Markov's illness in an animal that would produce some kind of parallel. A lot of work on ricin has been done on small laboratory animals, on mice, rats, guinea pigs, and that sort of thing, but very little on larger animals. And we felt that we could risk injecting a pig, which not only has about the same weight as a man, but has a skin on which you can actually see what is happening. By the afternoon, after the injection, it was obviously a very sick animal indeed. We did an electrocardiograph on it and found an extremely abnormal rhythm. And within an hour of putting the electrocardiograph leads on it, it died. Its temperature by this time had subsided somewhat, but its white cells were still up. When they performed an autopsy on the pig, they found hemorrhages in various organs, which were very similar to what had been found during Markov's autopsy. Dr. Gould concluded, So we are left with a clinical and a pathological picture which closely resembles the effects of ricin. So the final question to ask is, how did this ricin-filled pellet get into Markov's tissue? After word got out about Markov's death, Word reached the authorities that Vladimir Kostov had claimed that he had recovered from a similar assassination attempt. Shortly afterwards, an identical pellet was removed from Kostov's back. The pellets were analysed by the Metropolitan Police Forensic Science Laboratory. According to Robin Keeley, who worked in this laboratory, the platinum iridium alloy is biologically inert, so the pellets could, in theory, remain in the tissue for long periods without causing too much irritation. Based on Markov's description of the incident on Waterloo Bridge, authorities eventually determined that the method of injection was a highly sophisticated, modified umbrella. The International Spy Museum in Washington DC has a replica model of the weapon, and they graciously shared photos of it with me to use in this video. It looks like a normal umbrella, but if we take a closer look, we can see the compressed air cylinder hidden inside. The interior is hollowed out like the barrel of a gun. A trigger in the handle would release a powerful jet of air, launching the tiny pellet out the end of the umbrella, which would then embed in the victim's tissue. As the ricin-filled pellet sat in the victim's flesh, the toxin would diffuse into the bloodstream, wreaking havoc on the body. One hypothesis as to why Kostov survived his attack was because, through a stroke of luck, the pellets may have been sealed by the natural blood clotting mechanism of the tissue surrounding it, 
preventing some of the ricin from escaping. Kostov went on to write a book about his experiences called The Bulgarian Umbrella. Markov wasn't so lucky. Georgi Markov spent years voicing his outrage against the authoritarian regime in his home country, and as a result, he paid the ultimate price. In the year 2000, Markov was posthumously awarded the Order of Stara Planina, Bulgaria's most prestigious honour, for his significant contribution to the Bulgarian literature, drama and non-fiction, and for his exceptional civic position and confrontation to the communist regime. Let me know in the comments of any other fascinating uses of poison throughout history, and if you enjoyed this video I'd really appreciate you subscribing, it really helps out the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one!